Titus. Amen. And when we go back to Titus now, Titus, I think everybody has the outline tonight. If you do not have an outline, if you do not have an outline, please, please get one off the back table there. <clears throat> We're doing a series here for the sake of Brother Steve and Brother Raphael. We're doing a series through the book of Titus. Through the book of Titus. But we're doing it kind of in a unique way. We're studying all the different people that are listed in the book of Titus. And on the outline, on the outline, on the top of the outline, the front page there, it's page 15. Uh, we're up to number 14, which is heretics. But uh, under the title there, where it says the people in the book of Titus, it says so far in this study. Again, this study, how we're doing the study through the book of Titus, person by person. Different people that are mentioned here in the book of Titus. So far in this study, and the people in the book of Titus we've studied, Paul himself, Titus, elders and bishops are talked about here, the qualifications for elder and bishop, good men, saved men mostly, but just good men, gainsayers, those who are called gainsayers, what kind of people are they? And then Greek Christians, really is pronounced Christians, I believe. Uh, those from the Isle or the area of Crete. Talked about them, some things about them. Then talk about the aged men. We did that study. Then we talked about the aged ladies. And no ladies got offended. Talk about the aged ladies. Then we talked about the young women, was the next one in line. Then the young men. Then another group called He of the Contrary Part. Those who are against Christians are the contrary part. I'll talk about them and servants. I just wonder if we, uh, how people feel about this, servants and masters, that the Lord has set up uh, this in, in this world today. There are those people who are over other people. And they both have responsibilities to God. God. We talk about servants first, the right kind of serving, and then the right kind of masters too, to be those that have a position of authority in this world, whether it's political or even in the family and in church and even in the business world. There's in the business world, there's this kind of subjugation of one person over another and people are to obey the Lord whatever position they find themselves in. And I thought it was the most curious thought to me that Jesus Christ is serving others when he was here to the point where he washed their feet. Jesus Christ, the, the God, Almighty God. And also what we learned in that one verse, that 2 Corinthians, was it? Where it says that Jesus Christ will continue to serve his Father throughout eternity. To serve people in the right way, in the biblical way, is not demeaning. That's right. Even Jesus Christ said that example. But that's a subject you don't hear talk maybe very much. We talk about servants, masters, we talk about peculiar people. And if you're a Christian today, you're one of them. You're a peculiar person. But now we're continuing with the next in line, the next person here in the book of Titus is are the heretics. Heretics. And like I said last week, every time I wrote in, put on my computer, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-K-S, the red line underlined it. And I said, I don't care about the red line, the computer is wrong. <laughs> Here at Titus chapter number three, let's turn there if you haven't yet. That's so funny with that. Because the, the, my computer does not like Elizabethan English. Right. My computer does not like uh, the King James uh, kind of language in the Bible, the King James Bible. All right, Titus chapter three, verse 10 and 11. Again, the next one in line here, heretics. We began this last week, so I'll just do a quick, real fast review. We're gonna stay pretty much on time tonight though. Uh, okay, Titus chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, talking about the, the heretics now. Titus chapter 3, verse 10 says, A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, re reject, reject. A heretic is one that believes the wrong things and he's stubborn about it and he does not want to change. Christian, we have to understand this. There's some people that just don't want to know the truth. There's some people we were not going to be able to convince. Now, what do you do when you find someone like that? Pray for them. Pray for them. But a, a man that is inherited after the first and second admonition, after you talk to them, 
and even admonish them about what truth is after the first and second admonition reject. In other words, you, there's a lot of people that want to hear the truth. There really is. And there's some that don't know what the truth is and they might listen to you also. But it seems like some are so stubborn and so in the ways they don't want to hear at all. And I think what verse 10 is saying here is don't spend a lot of time with them. Go on to some other people. Now verse number 11. Knowing, here's something you know about this heretic. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sitteth, being condemned of himself, how serious his sin is and how deep his sin is. These kind of people. Now I'm thankful that most people are not heretics though. You'll run across them once in a while. Quickly look at the notes here. I want to go through what we did last week real fast. I'm going to re read like one of those, those people that give the dis disclaimers. What is a heretic? What is a heretic here at the top of the page? Uh, you see heretic number 14. Then you see the verses 18 down. The first one there is heresy. Heresy is any belief or theory that strongly opposes established beliefs and customs, particularly the accepted beliefs or religious law of a religious organization. Within Christianity, it is any belief or practice that explicitly undermines the gospel. Right. Go down to that third one, third where you see the brackets, the third one. It says the terms heretic and heresy refer to a willful choosing of false doctrine. A willful alignment with error. The will is involved in our spirituality or lack thereof, isn't it? The will, we do what we do because we choose to do that. We use our will and those kind of things. The will has to be reached for a person to get saved to. They have to be reached where they want to do now serve the Lord. They want to turn from their sin. They want to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The will has to be reached. If any man will come after me, as the Lord said. All right, the next one under that. Heresies came to be understood as self-chosen doctrines that do not originate from God. Mm. Skip down two more. We have heresy and bold print. This is from Robert Sargent, his good study. Heresy is much more than ignorance. It is more than simply holding to an error. It is taking sides with error against truth. That's a good definition there. And then the next one here, the identification and condemnation of heresies have played a significant role in shaping the development of Christian theology. If there weren't heresies, we wouldn't need our theology books to point out what's right and what's wrong, to point out what's biblical and what's not biblical. So that identification and condemnation of those. So we talked about that last week. We talked about heresy versus blasphemy. The difference between heresy and blasphemy, blasphemy is a contempt, showing a contempt for the things of God. People, even in their language and their, their verbiage and what they say sometimes, verbal abuse, it's a contempt or disrespect for God, shown in different ways, emotionally even. But heresy is uh, just believing the wrong things, believing the wrong doctrines. So there's a difference between blasphemy and heresy. I want to look up just a couple of verses tonight before we get into, uh, I'm trying to figure out what I want to do tonight here. Uh, I guess, well, yeah, let me look up a couple of verses. Let's look up a couple of verses first. And the one I want to look at, first of all, is in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15. Just 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. It says here that the difference between Christians and non-Christians in particular, but in particular, 2 Corinthians 6, 15 says, and what concord hath Christ with Belial. Amen. The word concord means to get along with or agree or disagree. What, what agreement, what concord hath Christ with, with Belial, the devil? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Amen. Of course, those are rhetorical questions. And what's the answer to those two questions? None. None. And there is no agreement between Christ and Belial. Again, a name for the devil. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? No, no. We don't get along at all. Certain people we don't get along with. Now we want to put them to the Lord. We want to influence them. We want to teach them. We want to try to reach them somewhere. We pray for them. But there is no agreement. There is no agreement. Oh, I'm trying to think of that one verse. No, I'm not going to think. Another verse I wanted to bring up. Anyway, so let's turn it down to chapter 11, verse 4. And while we're turning to 11, chapter 11, verse 4, in the same book yet. An unjust 
man is an abomination to the just. Right. And he that he that walketh in the right way is an abomination to the wicked. So, an unjust man is an abomination to the just. An unjust man is an abomination to the just. Uh, who's the Christian in that person, Proverbs? Just is the Christian. Mm -hmm. An unjust man is an abomination to the just. And he that walketh in the right way is an abomination to the wicked. Mm -hmm. So as Christians look at lost people, now again, we're trying to win them, but that verse in Proverbs is real interesting. It's abomination, that's a strong word. We don't like to see the lost people around us, do we? There, there's a reaction we have, there's a repugnancy we have, we see the world around us, and we're trying to win them too. We need to keep the right attitude about that. But that verse there, an unjust man is an abomination to the just. And he that walketh, ah, it's not the right word. But he that walketh in the right is an abomination to the wicked. So we look at them and they're an abomination to us. They look at us and we're an abomination to them. So that one verse, there's a lot of abominations going on in that one verse there. What's it say? There's a difference. There's a separation there. That's what it's saying. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter number, uh, let's see, 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 4. We see the differences here, too. Amen. Uh, he that walketh in the right way is an abomination to the wicked. Anyways, okay. 2 Corinthians chapter, four, or chapter 11, verse 4. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. Be careful. You might hear the name Jesus from some of these TV evangelists and others. But it's not the biblical Jesus. It's another Jesus. You have to have the right one. Come and preach it to another Jesus, who we have not preached. Paul says, another, they got the right name. There's not the right one. Yeah. Whom we have not preached, or if you receive another, another spirit. Mm -hmm. Another spirit, being right. the Holy Spirit of God. Do you know what a false spirit is? Yeah. Do you, will you recognize it when you see it? A false spirit. Mm -hmm. One of the ways I like to bring up is that. The Holy Spirit of God gives you the fruit of the Spirit. Right. Now, that's not hard to figure out. The Holy Spirit of God gives the fruit of the Spirit. And the first three listed in the fruit of the Spirit there are love, joy, and peace. Yes, sir. A false spirit tries to give you love, joy, and peace without the Holy Spirit of God. A, a false spirit tries to give you love, joy, and peace without salvation. Without being born again. Without believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a false spirit. So anyone that tries to give you love, joy, and peace. But doesn't talk about Jesus Christ. And doesn't talk about being born again. That's a false spirit. Right. Yes, sir. False spirit. Right. Amen. Important, isn't it? We need to know this. Because the Bible says in the latter times there's going to be more false prophets around. And we are living in the latter times. Right. So there's a lot of them around us. Be able to recognize that. Love, joy, peace, the Holy Spirit of God. That's the fruit of the Spirit. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit of God puts that in your heart. That's part of the fruits that He puts in a Christian's life. That's part of that being born again. But the other ones try to give you love, joy, and peace also. But without the Holy Spirit of God. Without salvation. Without Jesus Christ. Without the Bible. You see the difference? That's a false spirit. Going on here, it says, you receive another spirit, another spirit. Now, which you have not received, or another another gospel. <laughs> another gospel which you have not accepted. He might well bear with him. Another gospel. Another gospel is a gospel that does not include all the parts of a gospel, mm -hmm. of the real gospel. Mm -hmm. The whole the whole thing is needed there. Otherwise, it's another gospel. Another gospel. Let's look back at our notes now. At the front page, let's go, uh, just, hey, I'll go to the front page, I guess. At the bottom of the front page here, you see the line there, about two or three inches from the bottom of the page. You see the line underneath the line? You see it says, how do false doctrines come about? Why do false doctrines come about? And when? When do false doctrines start? Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. I'm sorry, 18, verse 18. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. It says there, 2 Peter 2, 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, uh, these uh, 
some of these TV preachers, you know, be careful of them. They're speaking great words, of swelling words of vanity, vanity. These are the lure, like you, if you're going fishing, you set out the lure, uh, the end of your line there. These are lure through the lust of the flesh. A Christianity involved with the lust of the flesh. That's not biblical Christianity. The allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, and I was just living wildly, those uh, that were clean escaped from them who will live in error. It talks about them in particular. Now let's go to the bottom of the page of the notes here. I'll just do a few of these tonight. How do false doctrines come about? Why? Why do false doctrines come about? And where? Where do false doctrines start? Where do they start? Like we said last week, some of the cults we see around today, like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, they began all around the same time, middle 1800s, is when they started. It's a very curious thing, isn't it? Very interesting. All right, let's look at some of these questions here. Number one, they come from a doctor counterfeiter. Yeah. yeah there's a counterfeiter around, isn't there? Uh, the devil himself. He's a counterfeit. He counterfeits everything that God has. Everything that God has. He has his substitutes and he has his counterfeits. So there's someone around trying to mess things up, isn't there? There's someone around that's not like the things of God. Right. And his goal is to destroy the things of God to keep people from getting saved. Yes, so interesting there. They come from a, a doctrine counterfeiter. Uh, why do they counterfeit? Well, to deceive people. Another reason they counterfeit is for personal, I put it down here in my notes, personal enrichment. Make, make merchandise of you. The false prophets, they're in it for the money. Uh, be careful, all their blessings seem to be attached with some kind of money amount. If you want God's blessing, send me $100. If you don't send me $100, you don't get God's blessing, is what they're saying. It's attached to money. Their blessings seem to be attached to money in some way. So they come for a, a counter talking counterfeit to deceive people for personal advantage to corrupt the word of God. Yeah. It's so much easier to corrupt than to build up, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So much easier to destroy something mm -hmm. than to make it. You know, they have a brand new car you brought or somebody bought on the road there. You think of all the work that went into the man hours and what it cost, brand new car. And, and one car could come along, you smash into it, and that work, all that work is gone in just a second, a matter of seconds. So much easier to destroy than to build up. It could take years to build up a church. It could be destroyed so quickly, so soon, so easily sometimes. So number one, they come from a doctrine counterfeiter. Number two, and this is an important one, it happens when people following a person or a personality, rather than learn, uh, learn and be, uh, believe the inspired and preserved word of God. Like I said last week, I had to do a little bit last week. There's a power in personality. Yeah. There really is. That's why not everybody can be a leader in different ways. But certain people have that ability more than others. Some have a, a stronger personality than other people do. There's just a power in personality. And that was up to the Lord to give what, what he wanted to every, every one of us. So we have a power in personality. But, but some have it more so. Like I mentioned, who did I mention last week? That evil... Demonic creature, Al Adolf Hitler. Now he can preach. Yeah. The devil's message. Boy, yeah, right. well, he can preach, couldn't he? He had some power there. Meant that he'd gotten saved and used that for the Lord. What a preacher he would have been if he would have. So here, be careful of personalities. I don't know if it was Martin Lloyd Jones or one of them said, false doctrines are taught by of pleasant people with friendly smiles. Yeah. You let that sink in. False doctrines yeah. are taught by pleasant people with friendly smiles. Yeah. Yeah. Be careful of personality that, that can lead you the wrong way. Don't follow a personality. Look well into their background. Look well into their life. What do they really believe? What do those TV evangelists really believe? Amen. Some of them don't even believe the Trinity. Some of them don't believe in the salvation by grace. Look into their background. Find out what they really... Don't, don't get uh, overwhelmed with their personality. Don't get overwhelmed with their preaching style. Be careful. And look into what they really believe doctrinally. Amen. Right. Right. Doctrinally. Number three, because anything that Jesus Christ said is important. What I'm saying here is, 
To believe in Jesus Christ, you have to believe what he taught Amen. and believe what he said. A lot of people today are believing, they say, believe in Jesus, but they don't believe what he taught. That's right. Yeah. They don't believe his doctrine. You have to believe, to believe in Jesus Christ, you have to believe what he taught. Amen. To believe in Jesus Christ, you have to believe what he said. Amen. If you don't believe what he taught, you don't believe what he said, you do not believe in Jesus Christ. That's, right. That's an important connection there. Another one here, number four. Because there are consequences of false doctrines. Yeah. That's why. People are going to end up eternally by what they believed here in this life. Yeah. Someday it's going to be over. That's right. that, that, that truth just impresses me more and more all the time. Someday our lives are going to be over. Where will we be then? For the Christians, of course, we have that great assurance and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we know about our sins. We know how they can be forgiven through the Lord. So we know that. But everybody needs that. But there's consequences to believing the wrong things. There's consequences to believing false doctrines. Where you will end up, where you will end up eternally depends on what you believe now. Where you will end up eternally depends on what you believe right now. Right now. Believe the right thing. Believe the Bible. Be humble enough to admit you were wrong. Amen. Yeah. And that pride thing, that's what keeps most people from being saved, is pride. They're pride. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to admit and realize you are wrong. Right. And say, praise the Lord, that's all right. I'm glad Jesus is right. And if I was wrong, I admit it. I turn from that error, and I believe in the truth now, the Bible truth. But because there are consequences of false doctrines. Yeah. And then number five, it happens after people have rejected the truth. Romans chapter 1, verse 19. See, first of all, everybody has a certain amount of knowledge of God. Everyone does. That's where everyone starts. A certain knowledge there. Now, what do they do with that knowledge? Yep. Do they accept it? Uh, follow to the next step? What the next step is of truth? Or do they reject it? Mm -hmm. Well, Romans chapter number 1. Now, begin reading verse 18. Amen. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 here. says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, who hold the truth in unrighteousness? That last part seems like it's not even possible. How can you be held the truth in unrighteousness? You can't. But they tried to. That's the problem. Now, verse number 19. Look at this. Because that, because that which they be known of God, may be known of God, is manifest in them. Everyone has a knowledge of God in them, according to verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. It's revealed there. For God has showed unto them now. For the invisible things of Him, invisible things are seen from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Visible evidence of the invisible God. Amen. Of the whole world clearly seen. Being understood, understood too. So they see Him, they understand Him. The things that are made, even in the eternal power of God, and so that they're without excuse. They know enough to make them guilty. Now, what do they do with it? Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. That's right. See, everyone has a knowledge of God, a certain understanding. Now, what are they going to do with it? Yes, sir. That's the question. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. <laughs> Neither were thankful, right. but became vain in their imagination. It didn't start out that way. They became vain yeah. in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was dark. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Yeah. Not believing the Lord Jesus Christ is wise and His word is wise. They think they are wise in these things. That's why you're finding that kind of educational thought, that kind of foolishness, that kind of lie in people's lives. They need to turn from that to believe. But we'll pick up with this again next week. Well, it was good to be here tonight, wasn't it? Amen. The prayer time, good to have our guests tonight. Again, Brother Steve Williams, Brother Raphael, talk to them after we close here now, too. But good to have you here, learning the Bible, finding what a heretic is, and, and finding out you're not one of them. <laughs> That's the best news we have tonight. When you're a Christian, you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are not a heretic. By the way, if you're not saved yet, why not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ now? You'll never, ever regret it. Right. Amen. Right. Heavenly Father, I pray you'll bless now. Just give us what we need tonight. What a blessing it's been here to have a good testimony, Brother Raphael. What, 
What a thrill it was to hear about him getting saved. I was served all these years since then and used him as a pastor. And now, please direct him and please provide for him yes. as he wants to do another work and build another church for you. Or we're excited for him too. So bless now as we're dismissed. Thank you for, for this good Bible study, prayer time, and our two special guests tonight. In Jesus' name, now we pray and ask it. Amen. Amen.